Carmine Gallo waiting upstairs. Carmine has been on the show before. Man, he brings it. Last time he was here, he was talking about uh, talking like Ted, talking like you're about to give a TED Talk. Today, he's got a new book out, The Bezos Blueprint, talking about the same, but when you write, he's, of course, Wall Street Journal bestselling author, internationally popular keynote speaker, has uh, been a Harvard instructor. Uh, my personal relationship with Carmine is actually a good one as well. He's the first guy to include me in a book. The amazing Carmine Gallo. <laughs> I want to start off with something that you told me actually in an email last night that I did not know, which is we have a lot of military members that listen to our show, Carmine, and you've done yeah. some speaking, I would guess, about communication, effective communication with members of our military. Tell me about that. Oh, it's always an honor and an opportunity, and I learned so much. I have spoken to everyone from Top Guns to Marine Corps fighter pilots to Green Berets in North Carolina. They even took me into the quasi-secretive training facilities you know, where the Green Berets train. Uh, so I, I really enjoy speaking to military groups, especially senior leaders, because in order to get to a senior leaders, leadership position in, at any level of the military, you have to be a very good communicator. Uh, the whole idea of a debriefing a mission is to break it apart, to communicate, to communicate simply. So there are a number of things that I've learned from uh, military audiences that I put into my books. And I've also noticed that companies like Amazon, which I've spent three years researching, will often use uh, methods and strategies for to teach people better communication, more effective writing that started from the military. So the military, senior leadership, you have to be a good communicator and a good writer to reach that level. What was phenomenal to me about your current project about studying Jeff Bezos is that a lot of the things, Carmine, that people would expect of being a, a better communicator, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, um, and I want to get into this in a very specific way, the way you start off in your book, which you say it's 2004, we're at Amazon headquarters and something big happened in 2004. Can you tell me about this, this particular day? Jeff Bezos sent an email that shocked his leadership team. He said, at our very next meeting, you are no longer allowed to communicate in PowerPoint. And you are to write, a, at that time, a four-page narrative memo. And he was specific, narrative, meaning real sentences and paragraphs, nouns, verbs. He wanted to see ideas pitched in writing because he came to the realization through some of his own research and anecdotally that PowerPoint is not the best decision-making tool, that anyone can just put bullet points on a slide, but it doesn't show that you really thought through this idea or this potential project. Uh, think of it from the back end. They call it working backwards. What would the headline be in a real press release, for example, if this product were to make it to the market? Uh, how would people use it? You can't really uh, articulate that easily in slides with text and bullet points. And so he replaced PowerPoint. He didn't ban it completely from the company. That's a little bit misleading. But he did impose this requirement that in order to pitch a new idea, you had to come in with the written word. So to this day at Amazon, it's very difficult to rise through the ranks unless you're a good writer. And they offer writing classes to everyone, uh, to everyone who wants it so that you can become a better writer because writing, as you know, Joe, is, is fundamental. It is foundational to a successful career. You found that Bezos, over his career, became a better writer, in fact. Yeah, I did this fascinating piece of research, and it was an amazing conclusion that I reached. I, I looked at 50,000 words that Bezos had written in his shareholder letters over more than two decades. Uh, you know, everyone on our podcast here knows what a shareholder letter is when a company is public. It's a public letter. Uh, Warren Buffett's probably the most famous, you know, writer of shareholder letters. Sure. 
Uh, but Bezos letters, from what I understand, I, I talked to a number of people, uh, including the co-founder of Netflix, who said, who told me point blank, Carmine, I, I have his uh, first letter on my desk. I refer to it like once a year because they're so beautifully written. They're very clearly written. So I heard that several times from people who had worked with Bezos. He's a, he's a good writer. Ah, okay. Well, let me look at these shareholder letters. So I analyzed all 50,000 words and I, and I noticed that from about the second half of the decade. So let's start from about 2000. He started writing them in 97, around 2007. The writing got significantly better in the second half of the decade. So the last maybe 10 letters. And the way you analyze that is putting them through a software program like Grammarly. And what I found is that the grade level that the shareholder letters were written for came down over time from college level to about eighth and ninth grade level. And if you study Grammarly and you study writing and communication, you'll know that the, the lower the grade level, the better the writing is. It doesn't mean you're dumbing down the content by any means. It means that you are writing in a way that is simpler and easier to understand. Shorter words, simpler sentences, uh, a better flow, active sentences, subject, verb, object. His writing became better over time because Jeff Bezos is a learn it all. One of the Amazon principles is learn and be curious. He's con he was constantly learning. How do I improve this particular skill? Because writing and communication and public speaking are skills. And like any skill, we can improve. But that's not, that's not what people think. We think that if we employ longer sentences and the fact that we're writing college level stuff, Carmine makes us a badass. But you say that if we not dumb it down to your point, but if we make some of these contrarian i think to most of us changes we actually beat the competition with this what are the what are some of these changes that make writing better that that really if we take it to a high school level what are you talking about changing in the way we write well let's turn to uh, nobel prize winning behavioral psychologist uh, daniel kahneman who i'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with because he was the one who really came up with that list of biases um, that financial people, you know, try to learn and understand. Well, Daniel Kahneman once wrote that if you want to be thought credible and intelligent, do not use a long word when a short word will do. That goes back to Winston Churchill, uh, who during the bombing of London in 1940 was being inundated with uh, memos that were far too long. And cons he said consumed energy to try to figure out the essential points. I'm not going to. So his, uh, his hey, solution. Hey, Carmine, I'm laughing. Yeah. I'm laughing as you say this because I'm just thinking about reading through your book. I'm not going to ask you to recite one today, but you actually list one in your book. And it is I'm, 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 I'm laughing out loud about this British memo that is just ugly. Like I can't even hardly get through it. And you're like, I didn't yes. make this up. This is an actual memo <laughs> at the time yeah. where they're using these thousand dollar words. So anyway, back to you. Winston Churchill's right. like, no, 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 no. Let's get rid of all this crap. No. So Winston Churchill, I mean, one of the greatest uh, speakers uh, uh, in history said, uh, you, you know, he said short words are best. So memos that use short words, short words are best. So I had to go back to class, Joe, because I was a little puzzled. What do they mean by short words? Yeah. How, how, how do I explain this in a book? What does that mean? So I actually spoke to uh, British uh, grammar experts and, and, and English language experts who said, oh, that goes back to 1066. So I had to go back and take a history lesson and writing lessons. 1066 was the Norman invasion when Latin-based words were introduced into the Eng English language. So if you talk about legal ease, legal jargon, those are mostly Latin-based and Romance languages. But the original Old English were uh, Saxon-based, Germanic-based. They were short, simple words. Now think about it, Joe. When you want to get in, an instruction across to people that is clear and urgent, you typically go back to short words. So for example, if we're leaving the house, I might tell you to turn off the lights. Those are all single one-syllable words. Turn off the lights. I'm not going to ask you, 
uh, Joe, it is imperative that upon uh, your departure from the premises that you reduce the illumination. No, if I just want to get to the point, I'll say, turn off the light, Joe. The same applies to business communication. One of the great communicators, uh, Warren Buffett, famous, the most famous quote, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. How many times have you heard that? It's memorable and it's an idea that fills an entire, entire books can be on that subject. What does that mean? But do you see what he's doing? He's using words like fear and greed. Fear and greed, if you look them up, if you look up their, uh, their lineage are old English words from before 1066. So when people, when good communicators want to get a message across clearly and succinctly, go back to the short words. As Churchill said, short words are best. I had not thought about the fact that there's these two different languages inside of our single language until somebody was talking to me about, uh, about just, just animals, right? We've got, we, we've got cow, very simple. We've got bovine, which is a whole, oh, diff whole, whole different mm -hmm. thing or, or, uh, uh, veal and, and lamb, you know, you've got these two t totally different, like, where the hell do you get these right. two? And it comes down, Carmine, to what you're talking about. These two different languages going on at the same time, but use the very simple stuff. And, and I love how you ground this, you ground this in a key component. I feel like we're all trying to prove ourselves as brilliant. When we talk, when we yeah. write, we're trying to show other people are brilliant. And you say that a key component is not to prove how smart you are, but to start with what your audience knows. If you begin with your audience, instead of you, you're going to do a much better job communicating. I like to say you're not dumbing down the content. You're outsmarting the competition when you use simple short words to talk about complex things. Isn't it amazing that uh, I was fascinated by the fact that as Amazon grew larger, much larger and m far more complex because after 2007, Bezos was writing about uh, things like cloud computing and Amazon web services. So as the company grew more complex, his writing grew simpler or his writing shrank Right, the words shrank, the sentence length shrank. It became simpler, uh, and that really is, and I and a, a habit, a habit of great communicators. But it takes courage to do this. I re I recall talking to a, a McKinsey uh, partner, so you know the the giant consulting sure. firm, and they only take like less than fewer than one percent of their applicants. So it's really hard to be a McKinsey partner uh, or a McKinsey employee. I was talking to one of the partners and I think I was, you know, it was prior to a speech or a presentation that I had to give to uh, McKinsey. And he said, you have to tell everybody to reduce their PowerPoints because these folks come out of business school. They're all MBAs and they walk into a client's office with a 200 slide uh, PowerPoint oh, deck. And so what he suggests, this is the partner speaking for every 20 slides, reduce it to two. That's hard to do when, you, when you're fresh out of business school because you want to prove that you know it all. But as you advance in leadership, effective leaders recognize that they have to simplify their language, simplify their message. It's, it's counterintuitive and it takes courage, but you have to understand that if you want to rise to any level of leadership today. I feel like Carmine, this is definitely an extension to talk like Ted, which I'm using right now to get ready for some talks. I'm going back and revisiting this awesome book that you wrote. Um, where, where it's not about facts and figures, right? It's about storytelling. Like in, in talk with Ted, I think that's a big aha that I got from that. Tell stories because we communicate that way. Use short sentences because this will, this will build this connection that you talk about in both books. Mm -hmm. When I was writing uh, the Bezos Blueprint, I, I realized one of the things that attracted me to Jeff Bezos, in addition to the writing, uh, was he is a storyteller, a great storyteller. And when he talks about the Amazon origin story, he breaks it up into a three-act structure, which is very much like a, a book or a Hollywood movie. Uh, that three-act structure, I believe I also mentioned in TED, but I was able to go take a deeper dive into this new book. All great origin stories have that three-act structure. Uh, the three-act structure, which is an easy way to build out a presentation or any conversation, is act one is the setup, 
what is the the state of the world today? Act two is the conflict, uh, the hurdles that you have to overcome to reach your goal. And act three is the resolution. I've worked with uh, a number of wealth managers at some of the major banks um, around the world. And when they are communicating, the good ones, when they're communicating to their clients about taking a proposed, when they're trying to persuade them to take a financial action of some sort, the best ones will almost intuitively break it up into a three-act structure. Here's where you are today with your finances. Here's the problem with uh, your particular course. And here's the resolution. If you take my advice, here is how we will build your wealth for generations to come. That's a, that's a three-act structure. And it goes back to Aristotle. Uh, this is ancient. We just have to apply it to modern business communication. It is so wild. It's ancient, yet we forget it all the time. And it's ancient. It stood uh, the test of time because it works, right? I mean, it, yeah. it absolutely totally works. I want to ask you. Joe, the brain hasn't changed in, in millions of years, okay? Our technology has. Aristotle, Abraham Lincoln, whoever, great communicators of the past, they didn't have Zoom. They didn't have, uh, you know, podcasting. They didn't even have PowerPoint. So, so the, the technology has changed. But this, the human brain has not. So if you understand how the brain works, you'll be far more successful. I want to hear at the end of our discussion, Carmine, get a little English major nerdy. I was an English major in college. And, and, oh, and, excellent. and you talk about sentence structure. And you mentioned this briefly earlier, and I really want to go back to it because I think this is a very simple thing that if you grasp this, you can get it right. Talk to me about active versus passive voice because I found this early in your book is a very powerful tool. Yeah, uh, l let's go back to English class, which I know triggers some people. Right, I, I think right. that's why people are afraid. <laughs> They're afraid of writing. That's why I waited uh, till the and end, I by the way, to bring this up. <laughs> I, I went back to class, too, I, I, because am I a, a a writer? Yeah, well, I guess so. I write books, but how can I talk about writing? I'm not an, an English professor. I'm not an English writing instructor. Uh, so it's very intimidating. Right? And so I found that in my own life, right? Writing is intimidating and it's supposed to be hard. Every great writer I've talked to said it's really, really hard. Uh, so I just, I, I said, let me take a, uh, you know, first principles, look at it and go back to writing class and talk to the writing experts and instructors and understand they all come back to the same themes. So there are very subtle differences in writing instruction, but they all come back to one principal theme. And that theme makes total sense in business, and that's active voice, subject, verb, object. The, the simplest sentence in, that you can write in the English language is, the boy kicked the ball. It's simple, and it's really easy to follow. It has a perfect 100-point score in Grammarly. The boy kicked the ball. The boy, the subject, kicked is the verb, the ball is the object of the sentence. Not, the ball was kicked by the boy. If you take the simplest sentence in the English language and just reverse it into a passive, lang into a passive sentence, it becomes just a little more complicated. Now imagine th when you actually have complex messages to get out. It's much easier just to stay with the active. 94% of Jeff Bezos' shareholder letters, the writing in those letters are active language. So active is simple, it's concise, it's to the point. Uh, remember the hurricane in Florida, Hurricane Ian? The first headline I saw was, Hurricane Slams Florida. Boom. Not, Florida was hit by a hurricane with 150 mile an hour winds. It's just, hurricane is the subject. What did it do? slams. So the headline writer is choosing a, a, an action verb. They're thinking about the verbs they use. It didn't just come across Florida. It slammed the object of the sentence Florida. That's how you make a headline that's tight, simple, to the point. And that delivers 80% of what I need to know. If that's all I know, I know a lot. The details can come later. That's why the active voice, if that's all you learn, is... Um, if, if that's all you go back to class for is the active voice, it'll significantly improve your, your writing and all of your communication.
It's a great first step in editing yourself before you send out anything. Yeah. Check for that active voice. And it's really easy to do. Uh, the book is the Bezos yeah. Blueprint Master Communicator, Carmine Gallo, at it again. I, I love how you talk, you've you taught us how to speak in, in uh, Talk Like Ted, and now you're teaching us how to write. Available everywhere, I assume, but do you have, a, you have a website too, and if people want you to come speak to their group, I know you're available for those people as well. Yeah, please do. That I do mostly keynotes and uh, CEO communication coaching. But yes, if you'd like me to speak to your group, please go to CarmineGallo.com and there you'll find a lot of information. And otherwise available where finer books are sold, Carmine. Yes, and, and audiobook as well that, that I voice. Uh, so audiobooks are bi big for uh, people who like podcasts tend to really like audiobooks as well. Audiobooks is a growing category. So the Bezos Blueprint is coming out on audio. Well, and, it, and it's funny, you, I, I said earlier in this discussion that I was reading again, Talk Like Ted for a couple of big talks I've get, get, that I have coming up. I lied about that. I'm actually listening to you on my morning walk. And then I come in and I begin right. then structuring, restructuring, restructuring my talk based on all the goodness you're telling me. Carmine, thanks for hanging out and helping stackers become better communicators. I love it so much. Thank you. Thank you.